Hey guys, welcome to the Wolf Den Podcast. How are you doing? Good to see you. Oh, it's spooky season. Oh yeah. Oh, oh, it's spooky. October. That means one thing. That means I gotta hit the button and oh, hopefully wait. it'll work. Yeah. Hello, you are officially oh. in the scary Ooh. mode. Ooh. How you doing? Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, we got oh so much to talk about yes. today. Uh, a lot of uh, news of Nintendo. Starting October off with bad news. <laughs> Don't you love it? Nintendo's legal team is working overtime. Yep. Uh, they're hitting everybody. The spookiest of ninjas. <laughs> Nintendo's ninjas. They're very scary. Yeah. Uh, but first, we got a notification here. We got 53 months from a very big fan, Will Wolf, damn it, who says, Hey, Wolf Bros. So happy to be watching you guys instead of the vice president debate. Oh my god, I forgot that. It's right thing. now, yeah. <laughs> but that said, who would win a Power Stone tournament? Who would win in a Power Stone tournament? Bob or Tim Walls? Oh, now, obviously. He, remember, he is a Dreamcast guy. So there's a very high chance he's played Power he Stone. He said he was like addicted to we it. We know something. he's a crazy taxi guy. Like that has right. been confirmed. But there's a very high chance he was also a Power Stone guy. I can't see him being an MVC2 guy. No. It could be a Soul Calibur guy. Power Stone, I'm very confident. He's not, not. getting a game <laughs> off of me. Crazy Taxi? He might be, he might be better than me mm -hmm. at Crazy Taxi. Crazy Taxi is pretty hard. Yeah. Um, and the other guy, whatever his name is, pick a game. Yeah. Just, he's a magic. He, look, he, he looks like he fucking sucks at every game. Well, because he's a Magic the Gathering guy. And you know what? What a I, nerd. I bet he sucks at Magic what the Gathering too. What a loser. <laughs> You should play a real man's game like Pokemon trading card <laughs> yes. games. Yes. Uh, all right. Well, anyway. Uh, Lord Nora J, thank you for the Prime subscription. Uh, let's get right into the news. All right. We? I got a nice little little mug. You might notice it's from, it, it came in with my Aya Neo Pocket Micro. Oh. It says on it, real gamers, no gamers. <laughs> So Tim Walls would get that. Ew, the lip is like it <laughs> like lips a big in. Lip, yeah, it like comes in and has like a. That my, my my lip goes into the bottom. I'm part having of the lip. a hard time trying to picture how that's comfortable to drink. It's not. It's really gross. <laughs> I didn't know I should have washed the underside. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, there's all this shit on the underside. Oh man. Oh, except for where I drank. <laughs> Fuck. Well, anyway, uh, that's fucking gross. Well, yes. why don't you read the t first article? Okay. I put it there. It's from Time Extension. Yes. And when you do that, I'm going to get a new cup. I didn't know how to wash <laughs> the underside of the lip. Is that dishwasher safe? It's it's garbage safe. It's going right in the goddamn <laughs> garbage well. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Nintendo is famously protective of its intellectual property and has a history of suing content creators who feel uh, who it feels have overstepped the mark. It isn't shy about suing slightly bigger fish either. Ooh. Uh, however, its latest move feels particularly heavy-handed as it uh, as it has issued a copyright strike against a YouTube channel that reviews emulation handhelds. Retro Game Core, a uh, friend of the channel, uh, in case you didn't know, is an excellent channel with over half a million subscribers, which covers many different retro gaming consoles. But its main focus is modern day portable devices uh, from the likes of Ioneo, Amberdeck, and Retroid, which are capable of emulating classic games uh, of yesteryear. As you might imagine, many of these systems run games from consoles like the NES, the SNES, the Game Boy, uh, the N64, and even the Wii U. And the channel's videos do a great job of showing off um, how these titles perform on third-party hardware, helping consumers make informed ch uh, choices. However, Russ, the channel's owner, uh, has recently had a video taken down at Nintendo's request, which relates directly to emulation of its products. It does appear that my worst fears are true and that I am being specifically targeted by Nintendo, he says in a statement uh, posted on YouTube. My Wii U video has taken down and my Wii U video was taken down and I received another copyright strike, even though this showcase video has no di uh, was no different than all the other tech demos and reviews I've made on the channel previously. You know what? I'm back. I'm clicking on Russ's statement. We're right. just going to read Russ's statement. Go for it. Uh, hi, friends. Well, it does appear that my worst fears have come true and I am being specifically targeted by Nintendo. So this was after the MIG Switch video had yes. already been striked. So this is yes. not his second strike. Mm -hmm. 
Um, my Wii U video was taken down and I received another copyright strike, even though this showcase video was no different than all of the tech demos and reviews I have made on this channel previously. So the Wii U video he's mentioning is a video about Simu on uh, Android. Yes. Um, I am still considering a counterclaim under fair use as the video was for educational use, transformative in nature, and had no effect on the market. It was a demonstration of a console no longer for sale. Even the Wii U eShop is closed. So the company itself has no means of earning revenue from Wii U sales. However, I am reluctant to open that can of worms with a multi-billion dollar corporation as their next step would be to file legal action. And as you know, they would probably destroy him in legal fees. Yes. At the very least, this means I am going to change how I approach future videos. I will no longer show any Nintendo games on screen, which is a shame because I love using those games for my hardware demonstrations. Uh, I'm going to join him to the best of my ability. I don't know if I'm going to be able to 100% commit to that, but right. I'm going to try my best to do yes. that because uh, fuck them. Yeah. If they, hey, if they don't want me showing their game, fine. But I'm gonna sh I'm gonna show people that you can emulate yeah. games because there's yeah. nothing wrong with that. Um, I don't know how that will play out when it comes to showing things like uh, emulation station desktop edition front end themes mm -hmm. ESDE uh, that contain Nintendo characters. But for now, I am going to focus on actual gameplay, which I think is the important thing. Yeah. Uh, I am also going through the videos. I am working on and blurring out any Nintendo game content as a precaution, even innocuous content like NES games. Unfortunately, this is going to delay some video releases. My latest video should be up right now, but instead I have to re-edit and re-upload the first. I know this is disappointing news, but with now two strikes on my channel, I don't really have any choice except to adjust accordingly. Thanks for your understanding. It's interesting you mentioned NES games because uh, I got an email last night. Okay. Uh, I don't know if I should say this. I got an email last <laughs> night from uh, the guys who made the Rugrats game. Yes. And they specifically mentioned this. Mm -hmm. And they were like, just want to let you guys know. You're more than welcome to show our game. Yeah. <laughs> because you, it's very easy to yeah. get uh, the NES ROM from the uh, PC purchase of the new Rugrats yeah. game. And then you can put that anywhere you want. And fucking... That's a great case of how emulation is legal because yeah. that whole game is an emulator. Yeah. It's running an NES game. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyway, uh, so he's got two strikes. Third strike means your whole channel gets deleted. Yeah. Uh, Nintendo, if, if he does a counterclaim, Nintendo can come back and say, oh, well, you have a hundred videos that have mm -hmm. our uh, copy. Yeah. That have our intellectual property mm -hmm. so we want to strike all of those now uh so it puts him in a terrible spot it was nintendo of japan that did this uh they did this the first time and it caused me because last time this happened it was the mig switch video and yeah. that week i was also making a mig switch video and the day that he got the strike was the day that i was uploading so I decided to blur a bunch of stuff in the video, and then I also blocked Japan from seeing the video. Right. Uh, that's something that anime creators did. I sent him a video of one of the anime creators. I forgot his name, but uh, it was two years ago, and he got 50 strikes, or I don't know if they were strikes or claims. Probably he claims. Got, he got 50 of them mm -hmm. from uh, Toei, and they said, you, you're using our IP, and we don't want you using right. our IP. And in an unprecedented move, YouTube, to their credit, said, how is he, yeah. you know, misusing your IP or whatever? Uh, and they hit him back with some bullshit that didn't make any sense. Yeah. So what YouTube decided to do was make a little checkbox on their back end that blocks Japan. And uh, they did that. Yeah. And they put him back in good standing and everything's good. And that was great of YouTube. They haven't mm -hmm. done anything like that before. Usually they just bend over backwards for the company. Yeah. But in this case, they actually helped the 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 content creator. And yeah. I hope that something similar happens here. Another issue is there is no easy way to block a whole region from watching your video. Mm -hmm. I had to have our MCN do it. Russ does not have an MCN. Right. So 
He's in contact with YouTube. Yeah. But uh, I don't know what the end of that is. Yeah. So for, for people like Russ, there should be a much easier way mm -hmm. to block a whole country because yeah. that should be something that should be when you upload the video. Yeah. Like you got to go through like 10 pages of like options of what, of what yeah. you want to do with the video. One of those should be, you know, region locking if necessary. So there is a way to block monetization in another country. Yeah. And it looks like that's blocking it from that country, but it's mm -hmm. not. You have to yeah. get an MCN to do it for some mm -hmm. reason. Um, yeah, that makes it difficult for people who don't have a contact at YouTube. What are they supposed to do? Um, and this is because Japan has a much different uh, copy protection yeah. laws, and it would be impossible to fight. They would you would probably lose if you fought mm -hmm. uh, their copy protection in Japan. Yeah, but here we got fair use and all that stuff, so uh, it should be a lot better to fight them here. Mm -hmm. In regards to emulation, we have the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and a whole bunch of shit in there mm -hmm. that uh, is a little conflicting. But I went on a rabbit hole. When I saw this, <laughs> I, I spent hours going through all these legal documents. Yeah. Because I'm not just concerned about YouTubers. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about the whole industry I'm yeah. concerned about emulation and mods and everything mm -hmm. because if nintendo keeps doing this if they keep just acting like bullies yeah. you're not going to be able to fuck around with the game that you own and, it's, and not just for nintendo games like this could have far-reaching yeah. effects on like sega games and capcom games and sony games and microsoft games you know yeah because if they can see nintendo can do it then other companies are going to know that they can do it too yeah exactly so one of the things about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act is that you can submit amendments for it every three years. They're right. called the exception, exceptions to the copyright rules. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always been confused by it, and I've always uh, wondered how to submit something and when that three-year cycle happens. Right. Turns out this was the year, and it happened already. Okay. So if we want any meaningful change, it'll happen in three years. <laughs> But you can publicly see the uh, the amendments that people have submitted and what that are being uh, fought over right now. Uh, do I have one? That's oh, this is a petition. Okay, this is a weird one. So you you just get a petition and you can just write whatever you want into it right. and, and send it over. But uh, I guess they pick and choose which ones they want to actually uh, uh, go over. So this this is what it looks like. I mean, I feel weird showing this because it's got this guy's email on it. But it is publicly mm. it is public information. This is petition of new exception under the you know yeah, yeah. whatever DMCA. Uh, this is by just some guy named Ken from Vermont. Okay, and this says. I am seeking a circumvention exception for individual owners of video games which have DRM, digital rights management, that no longer function due to incompatibility. For example, with modern operating systems, there is already an exemption for DRM that requires connecting to a now defunct external server for authentication, but that is an arbitrary restriction on the exemption from the perspective of the consumer. Either they can play their lawfully acquired games or they can't. For example, Black and White was a popular video game yes, released in yes. early 2001 for Windows operating systems. It was distributed on physical disks and relied on a DRM called Safe Disk. I actually remember this. Yeah. People were mad about this. Yeah. Which is so fundamentally flawed and invasive to the host system that Microsoft actively prevents it from running on Windows 10 due to the severe security risks it presents. Safe disk reached end of life over a decade ago, so this leads to a result that is identical to a DRM solution that tries to connect to a server that no longer exists, an unplayable game. At the time of writing, Black and White has not been updated or released, so the only way to play a game on a modern computer is to uninstall is to install a third-party patch that circumvents the DRM because in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, there's some provisions that say you cannot circumvent mm -hmm. their copy protection, which is bullshit. Yeah. 
Uh, users should not have to resort to petty crime to play their lawfully acquired games. Draconian end-of-life DRM implementations such as SafeDisk serve no legitimate business purpose and actively harm honest consumers. So he said, there, like he mentioned, there's already some exceptions in the rules, mm -hmm. but this would put clearer language. Yeah. Like instead of requiring that the software previously connected to a server, how about anything that would prevent us yeah. from playing the game? We're allowed to circumvent it to play the game yeah. if we legally own the game. Mm -hmm. If I own the game, I should be able to do whatever the fuck I want with it. Right. Uh, and there's other ones. There's a lot. There's there's a few others, but they're all uh, the, the other exceptions that people have submitted this year that they're ruling on right now seem to be uh, for preservation and for uh, libraries and stuff to archive right. and stuff. So it's a little more general and not exactly what, what we're uh, looking for. Mm -hmm. But it's nice. It's good to see some sort of progress happening. People yeah. are the, the right people are going through the right yeah, things. People, but, yeah. but again, this is just Ken from Vermont. Yeah. So <laughs> anybody could submit something yeah. for this. Uh, one other thing that I also sent to Retro Game, Game Core, because I went on a fucking rabbit hole. Yeah. Uh, one other thing that I found was in one of the exceptions that is there right now in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, it says video games for which outside server support has been discontinued to allow individual play by gamers and preservation of games, libraries, uh, archives, and museums. Where? I'm starting over. Video <laughs> games for which outside service support has been discontinued to allow individual play by gamers and preservation of games by libraries, archives, and museums, as well as necessary jailbreaking of console computer code for preservation uses only and preservation of discontinued video games that never required service support. So there they're saying you don't need service support. Mm -hmm. But the important thing there is jailbreaking of a console's computer code. This is directly referencing Simu mm -hmm. and Pretendo. Right. Because the Wii U is no longer around. They dropped yep. support for it. There is no more service for mm -hmm. it. So if you own a, a friggin' Wii U and you own a, a game for it that you want to get back online, it is perfectly lawful yeah. under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act to take that game, take whatever you need from the Wii U, mm -hmm. and get that shit back up and running using Simu. Yeah. Whether Nintendo likes it or not. And Nintendo doesn't like it, and they <laughs> cannot fight anybody on it mm -hmm. based on the current Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So what do they do? They misuse the copyright system that YouTube has. They misuse the tools that are available to them to suppress, you know, the people who are still like playing their stuff and supporting their stuff, essentially. Yeah. I understand the concern that uh people like to equate emulation with piracy. Yeah. And they don't want people pirating their games. They see people like Russ showcasing Wii U games as uh, somebody showcasing a way to play these games for free. Mm -hmm. But that's not what anybody's advocating. Yeah, It's just a way to make some more use out of the games that you already have. If you're pirating games and you want to make that illegal, fine. Yeah, There's nothing wrong with making piracy illegal. It's yeah. already illegal. <laughs> it's if I own the game... I should be able to do whatever the fuck I want yeah. with it. And I'm going to say that over and over and over again. But how do you really feel? <laughs> <laughs> um, also, I fix it submitted an exemption to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, but uh, that is on commercial industrial equipment. Okay. repairing firmware on commercial industrial right. equipment. Yeah, because John Deere won't let you repair your tractor by yeah. yourself. So what you, I think what you're supposed to do is take these proposals and submit them to the Registrar of Copyright. But okay. it's too late. Uh, they took them already. So yeah. you got to wait another three years for your, for your stuff to be heard. kind of sucks because Nintendo's doing a lot with yeah. this stuff right now. They seem to be going into overdrive in terms of like, going after people for this type of stuff. Yeah, people are saying that they're ramping up for the Switch 2. Probably. In Russ's case, uh, I mean, it makes sense for them to go after the MIG Switch because that's... Uh, uh, the Switch is uh, still available. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. still selling that. So I understand why they would want to uh, 
do something about they yeah. want they want to copy strike that or something uh not that i agree with it but i understand where mm -hmm. they're coming from uh them taking down a simu video that's just them bullying him at this point yeah that's there's no reason for that the thing is defunct and and, and not available yeah anymore. and our laws should be protecting us as consumers mm -hmm. we have the fcc for a reason they are doing jack shit yeah I'm, and again, I'm hoping that YouTube does something about this, but who knows? Um. All right. Well, anyway, in regards to for you, Jinx, oh, we will be talking about. Oh yes, that. they're Feels next. Like no one in the community stand up for themselves, just give up without fighting. What would you do? They're, they're, it, yeah, that's that's you, you the need problem. a whole legal team, it, and these people don't have any money because it's just a free service. Yeah. And it, if they took money, that would be illegal. It's genuinely like David versus Goliath, only in this case, uh, Goliath has a machine gun, yeah. and your slingshot's not going to do anything the, against the machine gun. The only people who could fight back under your behalf is a rich person with a yeah. big legal team, or the government, mm -hmm. because they are supposed to have laws to help protect consumers. Right. Would using techniques like Tacky Udon have used? Shows the phys game physical next to the digital copy. No, because that's part of the MIG Switch video is dumping the game. Yeah. I mean, if it, if it helps people uh, sleep better. <laughs> I've been getting a lot of shit on Twitter when I show a game being emulated. I've been getting yeah. a lot of people telling me I'm a piece of shit. Uh, and I don't get it. Well, Sp specifically Zelda. Not for that reason. <laughs> There's other say. reasons. Yeah. Zelda... I bought the game. I dumped it. Yeah. I don't know what more you want from me. I'm playing it completely legally, and I should be allowed to do that. There, it's. A, I would say those are just people with like weird parasocial relationships with like billion dollar companies that don't care about them. Yeah, it's so yeah. weird. So. It's very, it's very strange. Mm -hmm. And if and if if you're fine with Nintendo going around striking everybody all willy nilly, yeah, you probably won't be fine when they step over the line eventually. Like you have companies like Apple who are trying to tell you that you don't own the phone that's in your pocket you're right. just leasing it from them mm -hmm. they're now trying to pass laws where if you buy a game physically they have to now say that you are just leasing the game well it's a license to the spoiler game. alert for a story coming up but yes okay yeah uh oh i see that yeah i moved it up we'll just talk about uh ryu jinx and then we'll get to that one yes but i know people are waiting for the yes so not only is nintendo taking out friends of ours but uh another switch emulator is dead uh it looks like a popular switch emulator ryu jinx is no more one of his developers um what is it uh ripe repairy uh announced the news on discord uh saying that the lead developer uh gd uh, gdk chan uh, has con was contacted by Nintendo and offered an agreement to stop working on the project, remove the organization and all related assets he's in control of. While awaiting confirmation on whether he would take this agreement, the organization has been removed, so I think it's safe to say uh, what the outcome is. Uh, the message, which uh, you can read below, uh, also was also posted on uh, Ryu Jinx's Twitter account. Uh, yeah, this, there's a big long thread on the yeah. Twitter account. This also comes just hours after some users raised concerns noticing Ryu Jinx's GitHub page uh, currently leads to a 404 message. Others pointed out Ryu Jinx's download page also wasn't loading, uh, sparking more concern from the emulation project. Amid speculation, one of Discord's mods assured fans that the announcement uh, was coming, asking them uh, not to spread misinformation in the meantime. As it says on its website, Ryu Jinx is an open source Nintendo Switch emulator written in C Sharp for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. Uh, it began as a single developer project in 2017, cl uh, collecting a small team of developers along the way. Today's news is only the latest in Nintendo's ongoing crackdown on emulators following its lawsuit against Tropical Haze, uh, creators of the popular Switch emulator Yuzu. Uh, Tropic Haze paid $2.4 million in damages, and Yuzu was shut down immediately. Uh, Nintendo claimed that uh, Tears of the Kingdom uh, was pirated 1 million times before its release in the lawsuit. Uh, and issued a takedown notice for more than 8,500 copies of uh, Yuzu in May. So this article uh, and the posts say that Ryu Jinx took a deal. Yeah. And people, I think, are interpreting that to mean that the guy running Ryu Jinx took money to take it down. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's what that means. My interpretation is 
uh, they said, we're going to sue the pants off of you if you don't yeah. take this down. That's the deal. <laughs> Here's the deal. The deal yeah. is you take this down or we will take a lot of money yeah. from you. They're not going to pay him mm -hmm. uh, unless they're like really buttoned up, which wouldn't really work out, I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, they really screwed Yuzu, but they also had some shit going on their Discord and stuff. Yeah. Which, I mean... Who knows what they could have found if they got the law involved with Ryujinx. They yeah. might have had some stuff buried in their Discord mm -hmm. servers too. Uh like share all they need to do is share a ROM once, and yeah. that's the end of 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 it completely. Mm -hmm. Um, which is really, really unfortunate because now that's another Switch emulator gone, but yeah. not forgotten because this is the internet and it's very easy to find these things if you if you just Google around a bunch. Um mm -hmm. uh, but also they were working on a lot of really cool stuff. They had an iOS port. It did not have JIT, so it runs like trash. Mm -hmm. But, cool, this stuff runs on an iPhone anyway. Yeah. Here it is on screen uh, running on an iPhone. Uh, uh, this is uh, Breath of the Wild being choppy. Uh, Mario Party looks just fine, though. And then uh, there's Mario Kart 8 looking fine. This might be like a developer version that has some extra stuff running. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's just cool that they were able to get it to work. Uh, what else? They had... Uh... Oh, an Android port. This was interesting because they said, oh, we also had an Android port, which did have a UI, but due to driver quirks and OS issues was not in a reliable state rather mm -hmm. than suffer support headaches mm -hmm. and uh, the Android emulation community. We held back until a later date. Did they just throw shade at the Android emulation community? <laughs> Might have. I was actually excited for this because mm -hmm. right now there was just a Yuzu on Android. Um, and I would have liked to have seen another app that was on android because there's mm -hmm. all these emulation handhelds i guess that's what they're throwing shade at uh i would have liked to have seen all those other em emulation handhelds get something like right Phoenix, but uh, unfortunately we don't have that uh then there's other stuff there's they had something working where you could play against people on a switch you could connect to the internet that would have been stuff. a big deal that's probably would have got what got them shut down ultimately yeah maybe maybe yeah. nintendo knew about that already mm -hmm. Uh, what was this? Finally, we had native applets running. Uh, this would be the true revelation of Emily going forward, but changes. I don't know. It's... Oh, like, like a home screen. Yeah. Yeah. So they were working on a bunch of cool stuff, and uh, we don't get to see that anymore. Nope. So that's a shame. Um. So yeah. Uh, this is another case where I understand why Nintendo would want to get rid of something like this because uh, the, the Switch is currently out. So right. having a tool that would enable piracy, I can understand why, yeah. why that would happen. But uh, there should be technically nothing wrong with what they're doing unless they're taking uh, payments from yeah. people. Uh, or they're contributing to the piracy of certain video games. Yeah, uh, which it was argued that Yuzu did. It was yes. argued that Yuzu mm -hmm. was uh, given around copies of Tears of the Kingdom before that came yeah. out. Um, so it might, I don't know. It, I mean, I would imagine that people who work on Ryu Jinx are going to have ROMs and stuff, and they're yeah. going to be sh wanting the, the emulator to work good. Uh, before a game releases, yeah. Uh, so they might be sharing some stuff. So I don't know. There needs to be some sort of guidelines for for emulators to to exist and work like this, so that uh, companies don't come around and bully them. Yeah, I understand why they wouldn't want an emulator for a console that's currently out, but at the same time, I think it's a little necessary because when Nintendo suddenly gets rid of support for the Switch. Mm -hmm. It's, it would be nice to yeah, have the work. Like the work should around. start as early as possible. Yeah. You know, so by the time it's needed, it's ready. Because otherwise, if let's say you're only allowed to have an emulator for a console that has reached end of life, first of all, you have to prove when end of life is. Mm -hmm. And then second of all, uh, the development then starts when the life ends. Like yeah. that's not quick enough. It takes yeah. time to develop this stuff. Because uh, a lot of these you know, emulators are being done by like 
very small teams, often like one or two people. Yeah. And it's going to take them years to figure out because they got a nine to five and they got other commitments and you know yeah. they have to work on this shit in their spare time. And they're not allowed to take any money. Yeah. So they need another job mm-hmm. to work on this stuff. Um, so this is why it's important to have rules around stuff like this so that a big company can't come around and just decide they don't like you and shut you down. Yeah. There are reports that Nintendo lost millions in software sales because of DS flash carts. They are probably w- wary about stuff like this now. Um, I could see that because I bought a DS flash cart <laughs> back in the day. Um, I think the bigger argument would be Dreamcast. Dreamcast yeah. died because it was so easy to uh, just rip a CD. Yeah. And that was at the height of piracy. That was back mm-hmm. in like the friggin' Napster days. Um, so I can see that being a good argument. I think Nintendo has done pretty good at having, uh, uh anti-piracy stuff yeah. going on. Not to say that people don't pirate Nintendo games, cause that still does happen, but I think they're doing just fine. Tears of the kingdom sold a fuck ton. And that's why they, sh- they shut, uh, Yuzu down is because yeah. they, uh, quote ruined the launch of, mm-hmm. uh, Tears of the kingdom. I also think it is absurd that the project lead of Ryujinx was not made has not made a statement yet. Basically, all we've heard so far is a secondhand information from the dev team. Well, he struck a deal with Nintendo, so he yeah. probably can't, or doesn't want to, or doesn't want to poke the bear anymore. Yeah. Um, I I don't I don't want to throw blame on him yet because I mean he was shaken down by the Nintendo mafia. What are you mm. supposed to do? They made a native Switch version. It's not running in an emulator. Why is that so hard for you to understand? I don't know. What a native Switch version of what? Were you Jinx or? I think he's arguing with somebody in the chat. Oh. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Never mind. If the ease of pirating Dreamcast told the Japanese companies anything, it's that do not change your hardware just to accommodate for karaoke. Wait, that's a good point. Yeah. Because it, I, what, you could put CDs in a Dreamcast? Is that what it is? Or um, the, there's, there's a specific type of CD you need for karaoke because it's an audio CD that will play the lyrics on a uh, karaoke machine. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, anyway. All right. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, I understand where Nintendo's coming from. I'm not happy, though. Yeah. But again, the, you both Yuzu and Ryu Jinx, they're gone now, but you can still find the latest versions if you look hard enough, and the latest versions run pretty much everything. Right. So, uh, go forth. Enjoy yourself. You'll, you'll find it somewhere. Uh, all right. We're not done, though. No. Because apparently California hates you, too. No, California's on your side. Oh, California likes you. We yes. like California. California's trying to help you because California's new law uh, forces digital stores to admit that you're just licensing content, not buying it. California uh, Governor Gavin Newsom has signed a law, AB 2426, uh, to combat disappearing purchases of digital games, movies, music, and ebooks. The legislation will force digital storefronts to tell customers they're getting, uh, they're just getting a license to use digital media rather than suggesting they actually own it. When the law comes into effect next year, it will ban digital storefronts from using terms like buy or purchase unless they inform customers that they're not getting unrestricted access to whatever they're buying. Storefronts will have to tell customers they are getting a license that can be revoked as well as provide a list of all the restrictions that come along with it. Companies that break the rule uh, could be fined for false advertising. The new law won't apply to stores that offer permanent offline downloads and comes comes as a direct response to companies like PlayStation and Ubisoft. In April, Ubisoft started deleting the crew from players' accounts after shutting down servers for the online-only game. And last year, Sony said it would remove uh, purchased Discovery content from the user's PlayStation libraries before walking back the move. As retailers continue to pivot away from selling physical media, the need for customers' uh, customer protection on the purchase of digital media has become increasingly more important, California Assembly Member uh, Jackie Irwin said in a press release. 
I thank the governor for signing um, AB 2426, ensuring the false and deceptive advertising from sellers of digital media incorrectly telling customers that they own the purchases becomes a thing of the past. Forcing storefronts to disclose uh, that they are just selling licenses won't stop them from taking away digital purchases, but it will at least make people more aware that what they're buying can be taken away at any time. I don't necessarily like this. Why? Because it's just a label. It doesn't actually do anything. It, do it just so, forces them to put a label right, on it. Right, but I feel <laughs> like, you know, that label will make will make it much more clear for a lot of people. It's all about like making people understand what they're getting themselves into. Yeah. Cause I think sometimes we forget you buy something, you buy a, a Kindle book on Amazon or you buy a song on iTunes or you buy a movie, you know, from, you know, the Apple store or whatever you forget that th those can just disappear mm -hmm. without you even knowing it. So having the language there front and center, when you go to make your quote unquote purchase, I think we'll do a lot to re-educate people and remind them that what they're getting could potentially be only temporary. Well, right now, as it stands right now, if I purchase a piece of software, that is mine. Until they put a label on it saying this is a license. Now, all of a sudden, the whole transaction's different. Well, that's what I don't like. Well, no, because this even dates back to before like digital downloads on... They would always argue that with games, when you buy a disc, you are only buying, technically you're only buying the disc itself. The content on mm -hmm. the disc is, you are licensing that. It's a, it's a copyrighted work. It's copyrighted work and you have the license to uh, play that work. Well, we have the, uh, I don't want to call it a license, but we have the, the jurisdiction <laughs> to archive it and do what we want with it according right. to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. But if we're licensing this, it changes the whole transaction. Right, and like people need to be aware that they're only like they're technically only licensing these games. It's, no, it's fine to be aware that these things can go away at any moment. Right. It's not fine to change the whole transaction. It's a different transaction. Well, now. technically nothing's changing. Just the word is are changing. Yeah, the word is very important to the law. It so, changes the whole thing. So, okay. <laughs> so what are you getting at exactly? Like, so let's say you go you go to the PlayStation store or whatever, and you uh you want to get uh let's just say Uncharted or whatever. Yeah. Would you rather it say buy or Yes. Okay. So then if you if you hit buy. Buy means that you gave Sony money. Well, it's going to say buy no matter what. It's just in this case, it will say this is buying a license. But, okay, the point is when you, when you click on buy, it's assumed that you're giving Sony money to own something. And then at some point down the road, Sony can say we are going to remove Uncharted from the store. It, but that's, and, what, that's what I want. I want that to not be allowed to happen. Because <laughs> it's my thing. Right. I should be able to do what I want with my thing. Right. Yeah. Well, if they if they can get around it by just saying, "Oh, it's only a license," that's not helpful. It, well, it it could be because it would let people know that, like, oh, a mom, it's gonna let a mom know that no, <laughs> they, they no, don't own this thing. No, dumbass. It. <laughs> you look at a uh, store like GOG. They explicitly let you mm. buy the game. You download the game to your desktop yeah. and they don't do anything about it because they don't have a back end they don't have drm they don't have a storefront like steam or epic to deal with so you have that steam does not steam technically you're getting a license to play the game through steam mm -hmm. so you know that's gonna that's gonna create competition it's gonna force some companies to rethink the way not all but some companies to rethink the way they offer their content because, yeah, God lets you... I don't you... think it's going to do that part. I don't think anybody's going to rethink anything. I think they're just going to say on everything, this is just a license. And people are just going to get used to that language. Just like they're perf in California, they're perfectly used to everything saying that it has lead in it. Right. Because everything's got a label saying this might yeah. contain lead. And if everything has a label that says this might contain lead, then it doesn't matter. Because right. you're not warning against anything because everything has this now. That's what this messaging is going to do. You're just forcing the companies to put a label on stuff. It's not 
in my eyes, this isn't very helpful. It's trying to be helpful, and I appreciate it, but I don't think this is going to change much. It's a step in the right direction. You know, first comes with education, then it comes with, like, actual, like, change and evolution of, of how we uh, purchase and consume content. My fear is that it's a step in the wrong direction because I'm looking at this from the perspective of somebody who likes to take a game and upload it to my collection. Or right. take a game and put it on a device it's not supposed to be played on. Mm -hmm. I'm only allowed to do that because of the language in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And if they change the language to say, I'm not owning this thing, I'm only licensing it, that would fuck up all of that. Okay. In my mind. That's where I'm getting at with it. So I appreciate that they're doing, a, that they're trying to do something. I don't think that this is it. Uh, so I'm going to keep drinking my lead coffee. Okay. I wish there was a better, a happier ending to, to, to <laughs> this, uh, to these three stories. Yeah. Of, uh, us basically losing the <laughs> whole emulation industry. But no, you should be terrified. Yes. You should be scared about what could happen to your uh, library of games and where you could play those games. Because when this fucking Wii goes out, it's going to be illegal for me to play those games. Yeah. And the cops are going to bust in here and raid me for fucking playing my, my Wii Sports yeah. on my goddamn Aya Neo. Anyway, it's backlog time. Backlog! 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 Great news. I never recorded anywhere on here. <laughs> you know what? We'll just start it from the backlog. Okay. Hey, uh... You get two backlogs. Backlog! 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 Hey guys, hey, welcome to the backlog. The backlog. Well, what's the backlog? The backlog is a segment of the Wolf Den podcast where we go through our entire video game collection, every game we've ever bought, we put into an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, and today we're going to pick one at random and talk about it regardless of whether or not we played it. We got 973 games in this collection spanning multiple systems over many decades. 447. 447. That would be Hell of an Office for PC. Oh, okay. This is a Bob one. This is a Bob game. Uh, all right. So you have you played Neon White? No. Okay. I've, I've no, I, I know good things. I love Neon White. Yes. Neon White yes. is great. This is very similar to Neon White to its detriment. Okay. Because this came out after Neon White and everybody, including me, compares it to Neon White. And I played it at a uh, convention. Okay. And I was like, this is great. This is very similar to Neon White. And the guy sighed. And he was like, we've been working on this for so long before Neon White. It is supposed to be similar to a game that its name escapes me. It was some uh, acronym, but it's okay. basically there's a game that has a really big speed running community. It's a first person. Uh, it looks like Doom, okay. but it's, it's basically just speed running. And that's what this game is. Uh, but this is themed after, uh, I don't know, hell and office stuff. Right. You have a stapler that is okay. your like rocket gun, basically, yeah. that you use to, to shoot the ground and, and, and do rocket jumps with. Mm -hmm. And that is exactly how things work in Neon White as right. well. So that's all it is. It's just a first-person speedrunning game. You go from point A to point B and you try to do it as fast as possible. Uh, so if you liked Neon White, you might like this game. It doesn't run uh, as good as Neon White. I think that was better optimized. Mm -hmm. This feels more like a, uh, like a Unity asset situation. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it is. I, that might be a, a, a dig at them if it's not. <laughs> but um, I think it's, uh, it's great. I, didn't, uh, I played a decent amount of it. At, so I played it at the convention. And then I played it on Twitch for a little bit. Uh, and I think I was sponsored on, on my Twitch stream for it. But I played a decent amount after that. 
it's great. I don't love it as much as Neon White. I think Neon White is a little, uh, I think the level designs are a little better. I think the, it's got, it's more engaging because it has a story. Right, it's a lot yeah. prettier and it's a lot more optimized. Uh, so if you haven't played Neon White, you should definitely play that. Uh, if you have played Neon White and you want something more that's like it, you want to play this. Dragon in the chat says, see them. Yes. That stands for speedrunners. No, that's not what it's. S E U M. Speedrunners from Hell. That's, that's, the, that's the subtitle of the game. Oh, what does CM stand for? Uh, is Neon White well optimized for Switch too? I haven't played it on Switch. I played it on PC. And it runs on like every PC. I've tried it on my laptops, my uh, Steam Deck. So I'd imagine it runs good on Switch, but probably only getting 30. In so this game, you need a lot of friends. Uh, apparently, Hell, Hell of an Office is an early access game. Oh, it's uh, still not out yet. But, well, it, it will leave early access uh, in two days. Oh, wow. So we're, we're a little early here. Oh, maybe it'll run better. On October, on October 3rd, the chaos begins. Okay. There you go. It'll be fish, officially be available in a few days. So sneak peek. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little interested in Seum. That's a much older yeah. game where both of these games, both Neon White and Hell of an Office are based off of. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's like a big community around that game and there's been like people making levels for it and stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm a little interested in that. But uh, yeah, if you were into Neon White, check this out in two days when it's fully out. I, yeah. I feel bad now saying that the game doesn't run <laughs> good. I, did, I had no idea that it was in early access. This was over a year ago that I played it. Anyway. Right. I might have even been two years ago. This gameplay footage we're looking at is from 10 months ago. So maybe it's gotten better. Is there? Yeah. Do we know if there's a demo? There is a demo. Play that. Yeah. Go play the demo. Whether or not you liked Neon White, go play the demo. Yeah. That'll be at least a fair uh, uh, shake. Maybe I mean, I'll, I'll give it a try again. I'll see what's happening. I'm looking at the trailer for it right now on Steam. It looks like it runs really smooth and fast and fluid. So I'm I'm sure like they've updated it a lot since the last time you played it. I shouldn't have said it. It it. it it's smooth like it runs good mm -hmm. it just uh you know my freaking fans on my computer were going nuts and yeah. there's like not a lot happening on screen so it shouldn't really be like a big resource hog i just think it was like kind of a unity asset flip but Got it. uh again it was an early access and i think now that i'm thinking about it it was so early that there were only a couple levels so yeah. I, I played through it pretty quickly but now there's obviously going to be more stuff and it'll be out soon so maybe i'll jump back in and give it another try hopefully it'll run a little better than mm -hmm. it did over a year ago when i played it it runs well on steam decks uh dragon okay maybe i'll play it on steam deck so if you like speed running first person shooter type stuff uh give this a try it's yeah. fun it's got a leaderboard you can play against other people uh yeah give it a try it looks very good i will i mean, maybe try I'll the it demo try. on yeah. your steam deck there you go thanks for watching the backlog everybody uh Come to a podcast yeah. and watch it live sometime. Bye. Bye. But you guys stay. Yeah. I can taste the dust that I <laughs> drank at the beginning of the episode. Still don't understand that cup. I gotta and, show it to you. It, yeah. The lips. I saw the in. lip from here. Like the lip looked huge. No, it was that yeah. was a horrible design. Uh, Lord, uh, I'm sorry, Wizard of the Coin with 12 months says, thank you for doing more research into the DMCA and sharing it. The emulation and homebrew community as a whole would benefit from being educated on what they can do. Hopefully something like this can find a place in a movement similar to Right to Repair. So the Right to Repair movement actually helped us a lot mm -hmm. in the emulation community. I would like to, uh, have some language that helps software a little bit more specifically yeah. video games because i love playing you know homebrewed mario stuff yeah and there should be nothing wrong with with that under uh under our laws if i mm -hmm. own the game i should be able to modify it however i want absolutely um i have a video called emulation does not equal piracy mm -hmm. where it goes over a lot of that stuff but i've i might make a part two because i've Learned a lot more since then. I wrote, after I talked to Retro Game Core, I wrote him this big, long response because I went down a diatribe. I, mm -hmm. went, I went down a rabbit hole of all these laws. Right. Um, and I wrote this big, long thing. And instead of sending it to him, I just made it into a script. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to, or when I'm going to do a video on that, though.
Um, there were some super chats. We got yes, Koss with five pounds. Hey, Wolf Bros, do you think handhelds will ever come with expansion battery pack slots, like how expansion memory slots have been a thing? You mean like the Game Gear? <laughs> I mean, I think just the ability to, like, replace the battery or, like, get bigger batteries would be nice. You know, because a lot of them do use built-in rechargeable batteries. Yeah, like, uh... Like an old phone. Like, old phones yeah. used to have, like, battery compartments. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen anything like that. I haven't seen a handheld that has like well, there's some Ambernics that have a little battery compartment. I know the uh the analog pocket, like it's you know got a built-in rechargeable battery, but you can easily take that out. It's yeah, not you have like, to unscrew it. Though. It's not like soldered into the board though. It sounds like he wants to hot swap. Right. Like if he if he's playing it and he wants to be out in the field. Like mm. I, I knew people who used to have two batteries for their phones. Yeah. And they would yeah. take the battery out and just put a new one in. Yeah. Um yeah, there's some handhelds that do that, but if you're looking for like a PC handheld, that's like a laptop and yeah. they don't like doing that mm -hmm. stuff. Batteries are scary. Yeah. I just uh recycled my INEO next because it was in my arcade cabinet and the battery ballooned. Mm -hmm. And I was starting to take it apart to take the battery out yeah. to see if I could salvage it. And as I was opening it, you could see the battery was forcing the case yeah. off so much it looked like it was gonna like pop off. And I had a thought to myself that maybe the case is holding the battery together. Yeah. So I got scared and didn't want to open mm -hmm. it anymore. So I just took the whole thing to I actually what I did was I cut the I saw the the little ribbon cable that was attached to the power button. Uh huh. And I just cut that. Right. And then I gave it to Best Buy. Said uh deal with us. <laughs> Yeah, I said, do you, I said, do you guys recycle uh, electronics? He goes, yes, we do. And I go, here you go. And he goes, yeah. oh, my God. <laughs> uh, next, we got Forward Gooch with 10 bucks. Thank you so much. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Ryan Nass with $5. It reminds me of going under another office-themed underworld dungeon crawling game. Never heard of that. Me neither. All right. Uh, what's next on the news here? Uh, Ubisoft, Ubisoft delays Assassin's Creed Shadows will launch games on Steam day one and learn a lot from Star Wars Outlaws. This is like a whole big uh, Ubisoft uh, thing. Last week they had their uh, big financial call. Of uh, they're in rough shape over there in uh, Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Um, so let's just get to the the media stuff ubisoft has announced a dramatic delay of assassin's creed shadows uh, which will now launch on february 14th 2025 instead of the previously planned uh november uh existing pre-orders will be refunded the publisher uh has always targeted the year's key holiday sales period for assassin's creed blockbusters making this more they're making this move highly unusual in a statement ubisoft said the game's content was complete as you'd hope seven weeks ahead of its intended launch date but would now receive further polish. Crucially, Ubisoft said the delay could be blamed on the softer than expected launch of Star Wars Outlaws, its previous big budget blockbuster for which it had high hopes for, uh, but then launched in August to lukewarm sales. The publisher, uh, the publisher was acting now, it said, based on learnings from that game. Assassin's Creed Shadows will now launch on Steam day one, a move the publisher has indicated will continue with other game releases moving forward. Uh, in other changes, uh, Shadows will now ditch the franchise's established season pass model. The game's first expansion will be granted free to anyone who pre-ordered the game now, however. Uh, oh, that's good. They're not yeah. doing a season pass because that's dumb for a single-player oh, yeah. game. Uh, so, what do they say? While the game while the game fee is feature complete, the learnings from Star Wars Outlaws release uh, led us to provide additional time to further polish the title, Ubisoft said in a statement. Uh, this will enable the biggest entry in the franchise to fully deliver on its ambition, uh, notably by fulfilling the promise of our dual protagonist adventure with uh, Noe and Yasuke uh, bringing two very different gameplay styles. Uh, this, this delay also marks Ubisoft's first comments on the performance of Star Wars Outlaws. The game uh, received a solid critical response, it says, but it, uh, this has not translated to sales. In response to player feedback, Ubisoft's development teams are currently fully mobilized to swiftly implement a series of updates to polish and improve the player experience in order to engage a large uh, audience during the holiday season to position Outlaws as a strong long-term performer. 
the game will be available on Steam on the 21st of November. Eurogamer's Chris, uh, Chris Tapspell wrote that the game's uh, stripped-back Ubisoft formula is admirable, yet doomed in the Star Wars Outlaws review on Eurogamer. Rounding off today's news uh, from Ubisoft was a statement from company boss Yves Guillemot, uh, who is might be a bigger notable idiot than Bobby Kotick. I'm just throwing that out there. He, <laughs> he, he is genuinely a dumb man. Is he dangerous? Bobby Kotick, dangerous. Bobby Kotick was actively dangerous. Yves Gilmo is like naively dangerous. Yes, okay. like he's he- he's head in the sand. Dangerous. If it's okay. not hap- if I don't see it, it's not happening. Okay. Kind of dangerous. Uh, Yves Gilmo, who admitted the firm's uh, financial performance over the past quarter had been lower than expected, and announced a wider review of how future projects uh, were executed. Our second quarter performance fell short of our expectations, prompting us to address swiftly and firmly with even greater focus on a gamer-centric, gameplay-first approach and an unwavering commitment to the long-term values of our brands. Uh, Without any further explanation, Guillermo concluded his comments by weighing in on what he calls a polarized comments about the company, which he said was not to push any specific agenda. Here's the full quote. Finally, let me address some of the polarized comments about Ubisoft lately. I want to reaffirm that we are in an entertainment-first company, creating games uh, for the broadest possible audience, and our goal is to not push any specific agenda. We remain committed to creating games for fans and players that everyone can enjoy. It's not hard to read this as another comment on on the recent controversy whipped up online around Assassin's Creed Shadows, which was largely focused on the inclusion of an African historical figure uh, Yasuke and his betrayal as a samurai. Eurogamer has asked Ubisoft for more clarity on Gimmo's uh, comment, um, which uh, they said, to clarify, our goal is to be known for creating great games and experiences. Uh, that is what drives our teams, uh, giving them the freedom to be creative while staying focused on delivering the best experience of our players. Uh, of course, we're making creative choices. It's a video game, says Assassin's Creed Shadow art director and franchise veteran uh, Terry Danceru. Uh adding that he uh, was confident with how the game uh, would ultimately be received. A lot happened here. Yes. So the two main takeaways are Assassin's Creed's delayed. Yes. And uh, they didn't sell a lot of Star Wars Outlaws. Uh, Apparently they sold 1 million copies of Star Wars Outlaws, which sounds like a good healthy number for any video game, but they probably needed to sell 10 million copies within like a day in order to see that as successful. Yeah, uh, I'm curious. How, yeah, I, I'd like to see some sales numbers for some other Ubisoft. We have just found a list of their best-selling games. Uh, number twenty is Red Steel at one million. Okay, so that's their twentieth. That's oh, it's a franchise. There's two games. <laughs> Well, this is their top selling franchises, and number 20 is Red Steel at 1 million. Okay. I guess this, I mean, they don't have any other Star Wars games, right? Yeah. That's the only one. Yeah. So they didn't make any old Star Wars games. They might have, like, published a Game Boy Star Wars okay. game, but, like, that doesn't really. All right. So it's now their 19th best selling franchise. <laughs> so, no, actually, 20. It would be, it would be number 20. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's not. Bad and for a month for being out a month, that's yeah. not horrible, but it is a Star Wars licensed game. And I was, I would think that they were probably hoping it would sell kind of like what Jedi Survivor, did. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, so I could see why they would think it didn't sell that. Yeah, um, I think the game's fine, like it, it, it's not amazing, but like you know, I it made me want to keep playing it, yeah. So. I think. You know, I think a big problem was they only gave reviewers six days to review the game. And, like, that was not enough time to, like, you know, experience everything the game had to experience. Also, keep in mind, you know, the game came out on Friday, but they gave early access to people on Tuesday. So they got, so people who played the game really got a buggy experience. Yeah. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of the problem is Ubisoft Connect yeah. having to log in at all mm-hmm. and having to purchase the game on their own little platform instead of having it come out on steam which is why assassin's creed is being delayed yeah and they're saying that it will come out day one on steam yes because delaying it gives them time to reevaluate and maybe you know get it approved for multiple platforms yeah. 
Uh, but also maybe they saw that, hey, people are really upset with having to use uh, Ubisoft Connect. It basically locks you out of using it on the Steam Deck. So yeah. it's a whole platform you can't be on just because you want to put it on your own little stupid mm -hmm. Ubisoft Connect that nobody yeah. likes. So having Assassin's Creed day one on Steam will probably help sales a little oh, bit. And it probably yeah. would have helped Star Wars Outlaws. Mm -hmm. And I think there's still time to put it on Steam. Oh, yeah, Outlaws Steam. is coming on, uh, what, did it, what did the article say? Uh, Star Wars Outlaws is coming to Steam November 21st. Okay. Yeah. Fast track that shit. Yeah. Get that shit on Steam. So Insider Gaming has an article on, uh, they go into a little bit more detail on why Assassin's Creed Shadows was delayed. Okay. Uh, it's a complicated question without a single answer, but it boils down to a strict development timeline, polishing and addressing the Japanese community's cultural and historical accuracy concerns. Oh, that's interesting. To clarify, that does not mean uh, Yusuke is going to be removed. There's okay? so many Racist. people. <laughs> There's so many people like under the tweet and yeah. other people who have made YouTube videos being like, cool, this is being delayed, but it's not enough time to remove all the woke shit in the game. Yeah. <laughs> I love how like everyone's like, Oh, Assassin's Creed got with woke samurai. The next Ghost of Tsushima is going to be so much better than this. And then the new Ghost of Tsushima game comes out featuring a woman. And oh, it was like, oh, the, the oh, shit. oh, my God. They're kryptonite no! people. Not women. I wanted to play my Japanese game. But now I can't. It's not even a real Japanese woman. She doesn't look like the anime babes I touched myself to. We should to. be watching the vice presidential debate because I'm sure they're asking these questions. I'm sure they are. Why do you think the Assassin's Creed <laughs> game was delayed? We'll you start know. with Tim Waltz. You know JD Vance is just like is woke. Yeah. Nope. Uh, asshole. I, um, I tweeted that somebody said that in, in my chat, somebody said uh about the new Zelda game. Yeah. Uh Zelda's a girl now, woke game. And like <laughs> they were clearly joking. Right. And I tweeted that everyone saying, um, that's clearly a joke. Yeah, it's yeah. still kind of funny. It, it's still it a funny is, joke. It is, but like, what makes it horrifying is that you know there's at least one person out there who believes that. Yeah. <laughs> Who's actually looking at that and being like, yeah. oh, I don't want to play this. The, the big takeaway, though, is like the game is delayed for like significant polishing. Because like, yes. that, was, that was a big problem with Outlaws when it came out. As good as it was, it was not polished. And that yeah. like affected reviews which in turn affects sales i've been wanting them to take their time with assassin's creed for a long time did yeah. they release one last year was it mirage yeah. yeah but before when did they they took a break for they, a year like the, it, they've taken breaks on assassin's creed games and it wasn't it's never enough mirage was already a small enough game yeah so that was like kind of a break but they need to take their time with at least one of them especially one as big as this this is in everybody's been anticipating a, a, a yeah. japanese uh, assassin's creed game uh yeah last year was mirage and then before that uh was valhalla in 2020 oh so, so that's there's, a there was a three-year gap between valhalla and mirage uh there was a two-year gap between odyssey and valhalla and then before that um there was a two-year break between assassin's creed syndicate and assassin's creed origins okay so they've taken breaks. Yeah, they've like I think this was this is potentially the biggest break because mirage is like not really a full assassin's creed game. right yeah so good i think that they should polish this as much as they can especially yeah. because ubisoft isn't doing too hot no they so. are they're not doing well financially they're launching an investigation into figuring out why they're not doing well financially oh i could tell you i ex just yeah. uh, just ask me yeah <laughs> this it's, is it, literally people are just fed up with getting the game that this is what i mean work. when i say uh eves gumo is jet is like a genuine idiot yeah. because like how can you release the same game for like almost 20 years now yeah. and not realize like this is why people are upset yeah, people are how burnt you... out because they know what they're gonna get yeah, when they get and, this like, game how do you like infest your game with microtransactions and like season passes and dlc and weird crypto shit and not realize that like oh maybe people don't like this stuff I will give them a little bit of credit for Star Wars Outlaws. Yeah. I noticed you do not have to unlock portions of the map. Oh. You just walk around and it unlocks itself. Wow. Actually, they're, I don't think it... I think it just is there. I don't, they're learning. I think there's parts of the map it just gives you, and then there's yeah. parts that you have to just walk over to. But yeah, no, that... Uh, it, it 
still feels like a Ubisoft game, yeah. but the traditional Ubisoft formulas are at least changed a little bit. Uh, and that's the problem with Ubisoft is, like you said, they've been releasing yeah. the same game for the past 20 years. Everything feels exactly the same. So when we see that Ubisoft is releasing a game, most people are looking at it and being like, I know what this is going to be like because yeah. I've played Ubisoft games before. So that's the problem. Yeah. Just make the game awesome and maybe people will start buying Ubisoft games again. I do know that they, so they, they delayed Assassin's Creed. They delayed a couple of other uh, games. Let me just look up those. Is it Assassin's Creed in the modern era? Is it Assassin's Creed uh, first person? Is no, it- no, no, no. It's, um, what was it? What? While you do that, we got five dollars mm-hmm. again, or five pounds from Cost, who says I was thinking of future handhelds having a slot to add a second battery to extend battery life, like how we have the built-in M.2 drive slots. Um, yeah, there. I, I mean, it'd be a whole like proprietary like snap-on battery system. Well, no, actually, you can just there exists some things for the Steam Deck that like clip on, but they use the USB. So you can look into that type of situation because it's going to need a clip in in some way. Yeah. Uh, Ubisoft says that X Defiant has fallen behind expectations. Well, that's another reason they're not doing so hot. Yeah, that's another situation. I think we talked about that on the yes. show already because I looked at that game and I saw all these streamers playing the game and I was like, why in God's name would I ever play this instead of Call of Duty? Yeah. Because we have this already. It's been developed for years over two decades mm-hmm. it's called call of duty and all these streamers were like this is amazing this is gonna <laughs> i'm gonna play this alongside call of duty and now nobody plays it anymore right you know why because ubisoft paid them all to, uh, to mm-hmm. play the game well can't say i'm sure yeah. uh you want to move on to yeah to i guess, game I guess we could not a lot out of the Tokyo Game Show. No, I'm a I figure we'll just, uh, we'll just do a speed run of um, what Xbox announced at the Tokyo Game Show because that, that was like the real the big one. Okay, like they were the, had the biggest showcase. They showed off. Um, they opened it with a Metal Gear Solid Delta Snake Eater. Got a my, new. My friend showed me uh-huh. this trailer and I watched it, and something still feels a little sterile about it. Yeah, and I watched the old trailers from the original Metal Gear Solid Three, and. They feel a little more grand and stylized, but I think it's just because all the animations are hid besi- behind PS2 graphics. Yeah. And we don't have that luxury anymore because... Everything's got to look hyper-realistic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think another thing, too, is you know they're 100% trying to emulate the look, the feel, and the style of a very specific creator who is on another level yeah. of existence, you know? I, yeah, look, like Metal Gear Solid Five is hyper realistic, but there's still a style there. Yeah, I think that you know Hideo Kojima is like one of the few like video game like auteurs. Like you know what a Hideo Kojima game is, especially back in the PS2 era when like authorship of a video game was like very hard to like yeah. express. Like it was very explicitly clear like this was his stamp on the game. And now you're you're trying to copy that, so you it's al- it's not going to come through as well as you think it might. You also can't forget Yoji Shinkawa, yeah, is uh, basically a art director. Yeah, um, he has a very unique style for the look of all of the characters. Yeah, and, stuff. and you can't just take the assets from Metal Gear Solid Three and make them look hyper real. Even when they did uh, the Twin Snakes on GameCube, like. That was, you know, that tried to copy Kojima's style initially. And he even told the development team, like, no, do your own thing. Like, go <laughs> crazy. Go nuts. So, like, that's why everything is, like, all the cutscenes and stuff are much bigger and more outlandish. Because, like, they wanted to do their own thing. And I think it worked in that case. Yeah. I mean, even in this case, if they're doing their own thing, uh, it's not working. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm excited for it. I'm going to play it. Yeah. Uh, but... Something is just weird about it. Something mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not uh, catching on. Yeah, with. I've heard it referred to as like the evil inverse of uh, the Taylor's version of albums, <laughs> the shitty version. But, well, like you know, Taylor is like remaking all of her albums, like for owner, for authorship, but she's trying to make it sound like um, 
sound exact as close to the original as possible. And Konami is essentially doing the same thing with this. Yeah. They're remaking the game to retain ownership and making it as close to the original as possible. The only difference is like they can't. They they're they do not have they, the ability they to do that. They took it from the original author. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway. Uh, My Hero Academia is coming to Overwatch 2. That's pretty sick, That, that actually. might make people actually like Overwatch. Uh, I want to get Jason Schreier's new book about Blizzard called oh. Play Nice, and it goes into like a lot of like what happened to Blizzard after it got acquired by Activision. Spoiler alert, Bobby Kotick sucks. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not surprised. Uh, Age of Mythology Retold, uh, Immortal Pillars announced. This is a no new game in the Age of Mythology series. Uh, Starcraft Remastered and Starcraft 2 are coming to Game Pass. Um, Indiana Jones and the Great Circle gets a new trailer. Um, How was it? It was good. It was in Japanese, so I was a little taken aback, but okay. it was good. Uh, super cute Tanuki Sun Summer is coming to Xbox. Friend of the show, Liam. That's his game. Oh, yeah. Curse the Golf Guy. There you go. Excited to see that. Uh, Threads of Time is another take on the 2D HD RPG formula. Uh, this is a. Is this from Square Enix? No, this is a humble game. That it's copying the 2.5D version. Cool. Uh, we Love Katamari is uh, on Xbox right now. So that's fun. Uh, Hero Shooter Frag Punk gets closed beta. Uh, that is really close to being a slur. Yep. I, I, had, I really had to think hard about I, what like, I you, read, were, you were talking I about. I read that in my mind as that i'm like wait no oh frag punk. that, that would okay. be super edgy that would be is it uh, i think this game looked interesting to me. it's hard because like hero shooters are apparently not cool anymore yeah but is this described as a hero shooter yeah because this seems less like overwatch and more like valorant fast pace 5v 5v5 hero based first person shooter featuring power-up cards that bend the rules of combat that's the thing that's interesting to me. So yeah. I think it's supposed to be like Valorant more mm -hmm. than Overwatch, but there are cards that you get that change the way that the game is played. Right. And I'm interested in how that works. I think they're just ability. It looks now that I'm looking at it, it looks like just abilities. That's interesting because they're kind of like neon white cards. Yeah. But in my mind, it was like remember Flux? Yeah. Flux is a card game where like you put down a rule card and it'll be like the goal of the game is to have only two cards yeah. left, or the goal of the game is to put your hand on your head or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So it'd be cool if you can like all of a sudden just change the rules of the game. Like yeah. instead of needing to defuse the bomb, you let the bomb go off and you win, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. That seems interesting. I don't think you can dethrone a big game like Counter-Strike or Valorant, but I'm yeah. a little interested. Uh, Metaphor Refantasio gets a new trailer. This is from the creators of Persona 3, 4, and 5, launching on October 11th, and uh, it received a demo. Weebs are very excited. Oh, yes. Uh, a lot of weeb stuff in, an X in this Xbox showcase. I'm oh, like, I'm yeah. th that's crazy, coming out of Tokyo Game <laughs> Show. Uh, Antlier Yumiya, uh, the Alchemist of Memories and the Envisioned Land, uh, received gameplay deep dives during the broadcast. Uh, cool. Uh, Asura Jang Rumble gets a new trailer. Uh, Bleach Rebirth of Souls gets a new trailer. Uh, Wait, Bleach, like the anime? Yes. Like the anime Bleach? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's yes. cool. Uh, Sin Duality Echoes of Ada launches in uh, January 2025. Uh, furry Friends are coming to Fallout 76. So you can get a cat. You can get a cat and and dogs. Oh my god, look at the big stretch. Yeah. Uh, Suikoden in one and two remastered uh, got gameplay trailers. Those are coming to Xbox as well. All you need is help. Available right now on Xbox. I got puzzle again. Uh, Slitterhead gets a new trailer. Uh, Silent Hill creator uh, Kichiro Toy uh, Toyama spoke during the Xbox broadcast to offer a deep dive into his new horror game Slitterhead. We uh, yeah, I've seen uh, previous versions. Yes, this looks, looks good. Yeah. Uh, the Starbites Taste of Dessert gets a new trailer. That looks uh, stupid. Yeah, it's a strategy game, so not oh, it's not that. a hero shooter. No. Like a hero shooter. Uh, Dragon Quest Three HD 2D got a deep dive, so more information on that game. Uh, the Mana games, Trials of Mana and Legends of Mana, are coming to Xbox Series X and S, PC, and Game Pass. 
Uh, Final Fantasy Pixel Remastered now available on Game Pass. This is um, HD remasters of, I believe, Final Fantasy 1 through 6. So Square Enix really needs money. So they're getting all, they're putting all their games on Xbox. Hey, you know what? Totally fine. Makes yeah. the games more available. Yes. We're fine with that. Uh, so that's it coming from uh, Microsoft at the Tokyo Game Show. Okay. Presentation, I would say. Yeah, I'm not, uh, again, not a lot from Tokyo Game Show. No. Nope. I was expecting some more stuff, some more news. Well, I moved this up because they did show off Death Stranding at the Tokyo Game Show. Oh, right. I need yeah. to watch this. I, I saw the live stream. It was happening live, and I clicked on it, and it was all in Japanese. So yeah. Like, uh, they didn't even have subtitles or anything. Yeah. Uh, as part of a 90-minute Japanese language panel at the Tokyo Game Show, Hideo Kojima unveiled nearly eight minutes of never-before-seen cutscenes from the upcoming Death Stranding 2 on the beach, Kojima Productions uh, subsequently uploaded the English version of the clips to Twitter. Uh, would you be surprised to learn that they are incredibly strange and surreal? <laughs> Some of the screenshots look like real life. I thought oh, that yeah. they were uh, pictures of the actors hanging out. Oh, but, yeah. But it is just the cutscene. So we'll just skip right to that. The fourth clip shows off Death Stranding 2's photo mode with Sam taking pictures of Fragile, Rainy, and Tomorrow as they giggle, dance, and strike various poses throughout the uh, Magellan. Uh, the final clip, meanwhile, is another musical number featuring Dollman uh, here dancing along with holograms of himself and Japanese pop musician uh, Daichi Murora uh, to a new original composition uh, called Horizon Dreamer. This was the picture that I saw that I was like, Oh, what are they just like showing off like merch that you can get? Because you can like, get that merch. And then I was like, wait, that's the game. Yeah. Did you see the uh the video of them like in the photo mode? I think I just played it on it was this one. Yeah, so it's like dynamic posing. Like they just go into those poses by themselves. That that's insane. Yeah. Gotta, gotta play the first one. <laughs> I, I guess I do. I guess I do. It's just... Did I buy it on Steam? I did. I did. Yeah, I think you do. Yeah, yeah so I think I can... Uh, you can play it. Yeah. I mean... <sighs> I I only played a few hours of it, but uh, I gotta jump back one in. One of these days. I'm, I, I, like, I, that's a game I, I definitely know I gotta be in the right mood. Which sucks. Because yeah. Because you gotta be in the right mood to play a 20-hour game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh... So let's just see. The first clip uh, takes us back to the submarine that makes you blue with Sam Porter Bridges played by Norman Reedus and Leah Sudos Fragile taking a trip to the ship's bridge. Uh, the, the ship's uh, name is revealed to be the DHV Magdalene and Fragile marks that it's always like this when the DHV Magdalene is on the move. Uh, we got to see George Miller's character, uh, the Mad Max director, is in the game. Is a character called Tar who, who Fragile introduces as the Magdalene's doctor and a uh, geophysicist uh, fragile sheds light on what is assumed to be a thematically important single tier. Uh, and Sam has his friends meeting uh, with the kooky quarter rate animated puppet that we love uh, from the earlier trailer. Mr. Puppet uh, was once a man lost his spirit medium power uh, spirit medium powers uh, when he was adopted this new form and is alive and his own master. And his name is doll man. I want you to write me in the comments if you understood any of that. <laughs> so they showed a lot more clips. They showed uh, more characters such as Elle Fanning's Tomorrow, uh, a newly revealed character called Rainy, played by Japanese actress um, Shioi Katsuna. Uh, a third clip sees the return of a drive director, Nicholas Winding Rems likeness uh, for Heartman, a man who has uh, who has a heart attack and dies every 21 minutes before getting revived by an automated defibrillator. Heartman now sports heart shaped glasses and a Huey Emmerich style exoskeleton. He's just getting all of his friends involved. Serious. This is literally what it is. Why are they gray sometimes? Uh, I don't know. If it's that's like, I think they're like projections of themselves or something. I think so. Uh, do, 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 do. I don't think it says. No, I have. It's not gonna say. Well, because it <laughs> says in the next clip everybody's normal color again, but it doesn't. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't say, say that they in the were first in clip. their normal exactly. color. Exactly. It looks like when you see the prototype of a toy. Yeah. Yeah. That's what they. Look yeah. Like. Before they get the. Oh, here we go. Uh, the. Sh it's always like this when the DHV Magdalene is on the move. Whether like this refers to everything being covered in goop and people having blue-gray skin is unclear. Oh, so we don't know. We don't know. 
what is the ship? Is it a spaceship or is it a ship ship? It's it's a it's a vehicle. Okay. <laughs> a lot of questions. Yeah. A lot none, of questions. none of them are gonna have, no no answers, of course. I'm sure playing the game won't answer any of these questions. Yep. All right, moving on. Uh, Time Crisis coming to modern TVs. Plug Woo-hoo! and play. Woo, AI. No, oh, my favorite. Uh, Namco's Time Crisis is one of the most iconic light gun games of all time, but its home ports uh, was sadly been trapped in the past, restricted to, by the fact that the PS1 Gun Con controller needs a CRT to run properly. Uh, there are workarounds available, such as the excellent uh, Sinden light gun, but for most people, this classic has been remained frustratingly unobtainable for years. This looks like uh, that's all about to change, however, with Dashin Electronics has announced the uh, Gaim, a plug-and-play device that comes preloaded with Time Crisis and utilizes an AI-powered light gun that is compatible with modern-day flat-screen televisions. It's going to be demonstrated at Tokyo Game Show. There hasn't been an official confirmation, but assets shown on the company's website suggest that it will be based on the System 22 arcade version of the game, not the PS1 port. Uh, from That's the great. from the official site, uh, since the demise of CRTs as our household's main television units, uh, precision-based gun games have become something of a sweet memory. There are several projects that enable old games to work on modern TVs, but they are typically not ideal. Game is a product that just works and allows you to enjoy retro games as they were originally designed to be played. Complicated setups, infrared sensor uh, installations, and input delays to address these change these challenges. Uh, Tase Denki, the parent company of Dashain Electronics, uh, has developed a revolutionary AI-powered gun controller. A state-of-the-art AI technology brings a seamless plug-and-play experience, allowing you to play your favorite games instantly uh, with minimal effort. The AI gun is engineered to self-calibrate by intellect, uh, by intelligently detecting your screen, offering unparalleled accuracy and ease of use. It works from various angles and distances, supports all kinds of common, uh, common screen sizes, and can be tilted to shoot. It is designed uh, with a casual gamer in mind. This AI gun promises great accuracy, zero hassle, and a gameplay experience that is exhilarating as back in the old days. Uh, Tase Denki is approved by Bandai Namco Entertainment Inc., um, to bring this innovative uh, innovation to their beloved gun games and our fellow rail shooter fans. Uh, pricing is known. It's going to cost $89.99 for the base edition, the main unit and the gun controller, and $120 for the deluxe version that includes a pedal controller and bonus items. So it's AI because the gun knows where the TV is. Yes. That's not AI. That's not AI. <laughs> yeah. the, that means the old light guns were also AI. Yeah. Because <laughs> it knew where the TV was. And also, I'll add, didn't need to be calibrated. Right. Because it just knew where the TV yeah. was. Because it could see it. Mm-hmm. It didn't need any buzzwords. Yeah. Uh, that's very dumb. Also, So I, big Time Crisis fan. Yes. Love Time Crisis. Yeah. Want to be able to play Time Crisis. Hard to play. In your house. Yes. Like they said, you need peripherals. Um, I'm glad that there's ways to play Time Crisis. It's cool that you can get a little machine that has a little gun that will play Time Crisis. Yeah. What I don't like, and they're just arbitrarily slapping the word AI on things, but also doesn't look like the gun blows back. And mm. that is the whole reason I want <laughs> to play yeah. Time Crisis. That I want the a gun fun to little go, thing. Boom. You get the force feedback. Uh, I don't know if, because there were home ports of the other Time Crisis games, and I think those uh, gun con controllers didn't have the blowback feature. Right. So you, I remember we would have to find ones that had the blowback. Oh, well, in the arcade? No, no, no. There were home ones that had the blowback. Really? But it was, you know, it wasn't like the official one. Right. It was like yeah. some offshoot bullshit. We, I think we had to order them from Japan. Yeah. It was a whole huge hassle. Mm-hmm. Um. So yeah. I, I and, and you know what? This is the arcade version. Yeah. So give me the blowback. Yeah. I want my blowback. Uh, and also, I should note those the way Time Crisis worked was uh, there was a foot pedal, and you stepped on the pedal to uh, aim your gun. And you stepped off to reload uh, and take cover. Uh, this version of the game, the foot pedal is an add-on accessory in the deluxe version, so it doesn't even come with the base model of the game. And that's $120. Yes. I have been researching how to play Time Crisis on my arcade cabinet. Mm-hmm. And 
there are guns that are expensive. Right. A hun- over $100 for just the gun. Uh-huh. There are guns that can blow back. Mm. So that's nice. The foot pedals that I found, one of them, over $250. And it's just the foot pedal. Right. All that is is a button. Yeah. That's all it is. How, you can probably is use a, a, a foot pedal for a rock band drum set. Yeah. And that should work. Yep. So. You can use many things. Yeah. To just do that. I think that, you know, the difference is this looks like a diamond plated thing like it does in the arcade. But yeah. like, so what? Like, that shouldn't cost $250. Seriously. Uh, so there is a need for something like this. Mm-hmm. I don't know how they could miss all of these details. I feel like this is this is definitely a first, you know, a first attempt. Mm-hmm. So maybe they'll like uh, release this, get all the kinks out, and then when they do Time Crisis Two, the better game. Oh right, you know, did the first game have the blowback? Because I'm always thinking of Time Crisis Two. I, it must have. I think Time Crisis One though, single player game, did not have uh, co op. Yeah. So and the co op is the best part. Yeah. Aside from the blowback gun. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty sure the first one had the blowback gun. It must have. Yeah. Well, this picture, first of all, shows two controllers. Oh, but, well, but also <laughs> shows, uh, it looks like the gun blows back. $750. For that. Put, it on, put it on the company credit card. One up arcade. The last Time Crisis game was Time Crisis 5 in 2015. I don't see this as a story. So I'll just mention it anyway. This is one up arcade with a two hundred with a seven hundred and fifty dollar uh, time crisis. That's one up arcade. It's one up arcade apparently. Oh. Well, it's on their website. I don't oh, know wow. if it's actually one up arcade. Uh, oh, it must be if they're sell- if it's on their website. Maybe that's why the guns blow back because this Maybe. is deluxe. Maybe this is one and two. Point blank steel gunner steel gunner two. Mm-hmm. Uh, doesn't say. Yeah, just the first time crisis. Okay. But the reason why I'm bringing up One Up Arcade is because uh, they, today, I think this is new. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, pre-order. Full-size claw machine for $500. You can get a claw machine in your house for $500. <laughs> why would you ever want a claw machine in your house? I mean, people are really into like that retro like arcade aesthetic. You know, maybe they got kids and they want to, like, make them earn something. You know, like, yeah, you can get a new toy. Get it out of the claw get machine. Get it out of the claw yeah. machine. There are different modes. There's easy, medium, and scam. <laughs> it's really called it's scam? It's called scam mode. That's great. So, I think that's ridiculous. So, Wikipedia says It's on that, Amazon Prime, by the way. <laughs> Wikipedia says that Time Crisis 1 is single player. Uh, this... One Up Arcade has two guns because it comes with other games. Probably. Okay, yeah. yeah. Along with Time Crisis, it comes with a Point Blank, Steel Gunner, and Steel Gunner Two. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Oh, two uh, mechanical slide action. So the the Time Crisis Arcade does have the blowback, but the One Up Arcade. One Up Arcade. Yeah. yeah. So this is a looks like a. PlayStation 1 version that looks like it has the slide back. Uh, yeah, but I don't know. I mean, They look identical to like the arcade versions, but I don't know if like it actually blows back. Oh, may- yeah, maybe it was designed after that. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. We want the blowback. Right. Why else am I <laughs> playing uh, this game? Yeah. I'm not going to get blown back. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's what's um? Sony doubles the price of Horizon Zero Dawn. What's going on today? Sony has doubled the price of the PlayStation Four game Horizon Zero Dawn following the reveal of its PS Five remaster. Eurogamer spotted the price increase in the UK from fifteen ninety uh from fifteen ninety nine British pounds to thirty four ninety nine but the price also rose in the US jumping from nineteen ninety nine US to thirty nine ninety nine on the PlayStation Store. Horizon Zero Dawn has been at a previous uh, price point for years as part of the PlayStation Hits collection and other entries such as God of War and The Last of Us Remastered have remained at the typical twenty dollar price. 
Uh, the price rise comes just days after Sony announced a remaster of the seven-year-old game at its 2024 State of Play, broadcast alongside a friendly $10 upgrade price for those who already own it. Uh, the game... or Otherwise, will cost $49.99. So the price rise is essentially to stop players from buying the $20 PS4 game and paying another $10 for the upgrade. This comes after Sony pulled Horizon Zero Dawn from the PlayStation Plus Extras game catalog in May. The 2017 game uh, has therefore gone from free to subscribers to $20 and now $40 in the last four months or $50 for those wanting the best version. The PS5 version of Horizon Zero Dawn arrives on October 31st uh, with 10 hours of re-recorded dialogue and visual enhancements. It's a repricing because they're making a new version. Right. Uh, if you if it, you if you don't have a PS5 and you still just have a PS4, it's $40 for you. Uh, and if you have a PS5, it's gonna be $50 for you. It's just stupid to re-release the game. It's stupid yeah. to make a new version of the game. I understand like doing a like ps5 enhanced version mm -hmm. like i get that take full advantage of your system i even understand like a ten dollar upgrade for it like I, it sucks but like okay sure get your money but like don't get your money this way like literally doubling the price overnight <laughs> yeah no yeah i don't like that because that I, it's all because they're made they're they made a new version right. and they put a lot of they probably put a decent amount of money into right. this new version which didn't need to happen 10 hours of re-recorded dialogue dialogue's not that great in that game <laughs> i bet you uh they are gonna make a lot of money off of it probably uh which is stupid yeah i don't like this whole world where we're getting uh, uh remasters on the very next generation of console right you know? doesn't need to happen like yeah that. Uh, all right. Epic is suing Google again. Yeah, and Samsung's in the mix too. Yo, they're, Four, they're suing everybody. Yeah, uh, talk about a rich guy helping you, the consumer. <laughs> uh, four years after Epic sued Google for running an illegal app store monopoly, a case it won this past December, uh, Epic is suing again. The Fortnite game developer has filed a second antitrust lawsuit against Google, and now additionally Samsung, accusing them of illegally conspiring to undermine third-party app stores. The lawsuit revolves around Samsung's auto blocker feature, which comes uh, turned on by default on new Samsung phones. While it's turned on, it automatically keeps users from installing apps unless they come from an authorized source, namely Google or Samsung's app store. Epic claims there is no process for any rival store to become authorized. When Epic filed its original lawsuits against Google and Apple in August of 2020, uh, it didn't yet have its own mobile app store. Now it does. On August 16th, it launched the Epic Game Store on Android phones globally and on iOS in European uh, Union countries where the EU Digital Markets Act forced Apple to allow alternate stores. But a month before it could launch its own store, Epic alleges uh, Samsung suddenly decided to make Autoblocker more or less on by default, making it harder for new phone buyers to install competing apps themselves. Yeah, this is something I see all the time, even on uh, Android handhelds. Yeah. Like the emulators. Uh, you have to enable... Uh, you even get it on your Mac uh, yeah. when you want to install an app. Yeah. Uh, you have to allow it from yeah. unknown sources. It's the same thing. Uh, Epic claims it now requires an exceptionally uh, erroneous 21-step process to download a third-party app store onto the Samsung phone, making, uh, making it that much more likely users will give up uh, somewhere along the way. 21 steps? That's a re. <laughs> While 21 <laughs> steps seems like an exaggeration, Epic's own website claims turning off autoblocker takes just four steps. Uh, I can see, uh, this writer can see the company's point when they tried it uh, on their own Samsung phone. Not only does Autoblocker prevent them from installing the new Epic Game Store, uh, the can't install app pop-up no longer tells them how to turn off Autoblocker. Uh, when you search for turn off auto blocker in the Samsung uh, universal search bar, there are no relevant search results. Um, when they search auto block, when they search for auto blocker, uh, the writer had to tap through several additional screens to shut it off. One of them asked the writer if they are really sure claiming auto blocker keeps their phone safe by blocking threats and other suspicious activity. Today, Epic alleges that promise of safety is entirely bogus. Autoblocker conducts no assessment of the safety or security of any specific source or any specific app before blocking the installation, the legal claimant uh, reads. Uh, the, 
The thing's not designed to protect against malware, with, uh, which would be completely legitimate purpose. Uh, the thing is designed to prevent competition. It says Epic CEO and my best friend, because he liked the tweet of mine one time, Tim Sweeney. Mm-hmm. Uh, in a, it just goes on. <laughs> yeah, so this is interesting because yes. we've been, if you're a longtime listener of the Wolf Den podcast, used to be called Wolf Den Live. Yes. Uh, we've been talking for many years about the lawsuits of Epic Games versus everyone, really. Everyone, yeah. But uh, they've been fighting Apple for a really long time. Yeah. Um, now uh, they also went on to fight Google. But, well, at the same time, it was Apple and Google at the same time. Yeah. Uh, if you've been following along, the EU took their side, and now the EU is forcing uh, Apple and Google to, uh, well, Apple specifically. They're forcing them to uh, have alternative app stores. Yes. Uh, this goes against those laws. Yeah. Because this is an alternative app store that is being prevented by some sort of blocker, the auto blocker. Yeah. So uh, if Apple did that, they would get, you know. Yeah. They, they would have some sort of reprimand in the EU. But this is an American case, right? Yeah. Yeah. And this is Google. So yeah. It's weird that Google, that this is a Google issue. Because I mean, Google's been cool with uh, apps, uh, with the alternative well, apps and I stuff think, and sideloading. I think, like, you know, on one hand, like, Epic already beat Google in court because they won that court case. Mm-hmm. So they figured go after them again. You know? Also, too, well, like... Well, they won the court case. Now you need to, you know, uh, do what... You're supposed to because you lost the court case. I think also too, like the U.S. government has been coming down like hard on Google for like antitrust law and monopoly tactics and things like that. So it's just one more like one more paddle in Google's like long going, you know, war to stay relevant yeah. and in business. Now do Nintendo next. Yes. <laughs> um. Okay. PS5 home screen now has annoying ads. It had annoying ads. Now it doesn't anymore. Original story. The PlayStation 5 now uh, now has an advert system built into the dashboard user interface. You can't disable without disconnecting from the internet. Users notice how, how hovering over a video game icon on the homepage now forces an advert to replace the unique art uh, as close to as close to a theme as the PlayStation 5 gets. What appears to be happening is the PS5 is pulling in the latest news for each game, whether it be a YouTube video, patch notes, or even an announcement of a different game entirely. However, some users have criticized the move for replacing main video game images on the homepage uh, with what are, in some cases, outdated adverts. IGN tested uh, testing shows that the latest promotional Warhammer 40K uh, Space Marine 2 video published by Focus Entertainment has been replaced uh has replaced the art of protagonist Titus with the background of a home screen. Uh, Black Myth Wukon, meanwhile, now forces an image signaling the latest patch notes. And Call of Duty promotes uh, the haunting update for Season 6. Other users have reported uh, reported particularly confusing ads. Uh, MP First showed how an ad for the upcoming LEGO Horizon Adventure takes up the background when selecting Horizon Zero Dawn, making it look like you're about to play a different game that's not out yet. Perhaps most annoying of all, some of the latest news uh, the PS5 is pulling from is significantly out of date, which may confuse uh, some less uh, clued up users. For example, Spider-Man Miles Morales brute forces an advert for the coming soon theatrical release of Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse, which came out in June of 2023. Uh, This, I get this, like if you're going to hover over a game, I get having like information yeah. about new stuff with the game uh it is very confusing though if the whole screen turns into an advertisement for something that is not the game like yeah. in this case spider-man you're trying to play spider-man and the whole screen turns into go across the spider-verse watch the spider-verse movie. yeah no that should be in a little corner somewhere so an update to this sony has blamed the recent change uh to a technical error which uh now says has been resolved IGN testing uh, shows newsfeed items are no longer being forced upon the PS5 users when they select the game. Original game art is now shown in the home screen background instead. Uh, in a tweet, Sony said that a technical error uh, with the official news feature on the PS5 console has been resolved. There have been no changes to the way game news is displayed on the PS5. Uh, so it should be you hover over a game. The background is the game. Yeah. 
And then a little box, you can have Spider Verse. Yeah. You can have watch this YouTube video about Warhammer. You know, like that's fine. A little news feed. So it looks like they fixed that. So it's back to the way it was. Right. I will note, however, that the PlayStation Network has been down. Oh yeah. For a while. Uh, it was back online now, but it was down uh, following a lengthy outage. So not as bad as it was back in the day. Yes, but but still, it did go down. Notable. It does go down pretty often. Yeah. So last news. So glad you're paying like a thousand dollars a year for PlayStation Plus. Last news. Uh, PlayStation Five thirtieth anniversary stuff went up for pre order, and uh, no one was able to get it. Correct. Uh, it seems like, uh, it was a giant, massive shit show mm-hmm. and more people wanted it than I even thought would have wanted more it. people wanted it than they did like an actual PS5 pro. Like you can still get a PS5 pro, like yeah. they're available. The 30th anniversary edition is the one everybody wanted. Yeah. So. Well, I understand Yeah, because they made it pretty. Yeah. Well, anyway, apparently it went a little better in Japan. Uh, Sony seems to be taking a smart tact with its uh, fans in Japan, introducing a additional requirements for determining who can buy stuff, limiting PS1 style consoles and accessories to only those who have played at least 30 hours on their PSN account in the past 10 years. They're taking the Valve approach. Yes. That's actually not a terrible idea. Yes. Uh, the details are laid out in the PlayStation Jip, uh, Japan website. Uh, overview for the PlayStation 30th Anniversary Collection pre-orders. To be eligible to buy anything from the retro-looking PS5 to the DualShock-inspired DualSense, users in Japan will have to have uh, played either their PS4 or PS5 at least a little bit in the last 10 years. The total time that either the PS5 or the PS4 or both is turned on uh, for more than 30 hours in total between Saturday, February 20th, February 22nd, 2014, and Thursday, September 19th, 2024, at 23 hours and uh, 59 minutes, uh, while signed in with the Sony account to apply. That's actually, they should have done, why didn't they do that here? Probably because they didn't think it would be a big deal. <laughs> they didn't think anybody would want it? Yeah. I saw eBay listings for this uh, PS5. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can find it on eBay. Yeah. Uh. Yep. Well, here's one for five grand. There you go. Oh, here's a good one for fifty thousand or best offer. You can or submit best an offer. offer. Yeah. But fifty to three thousand, six thousand, three thousand, five thousand, one thousand, four thousand. This is what people are selling the PlayStation Five Pro anniversary bundle. Yeah. So scalpers got it. Yep. If I was able to buy one. What was it? Was it nine hundred dollars? We were not, speculating it was that nine, it was going to yeah. be nine hundred dollars. Did we get that right? I think so. If I got this thing for nine hundred dollars and I saw I could get five on eBay, yeah. I would probably sell it on eBay. <laughs> so, oh wait, here's a yep. Yeah, wait, let's say thousand dollars. PlayStation Five Pro console. This listing says it was a thousand dollars. Here, uh, anniversary collection. Uh, where's the system? Look. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, unless this is a different country. Yeah. But it says $1,000. No, I don't want the shapes of play. That's I want more the... than we thought it was. Gonna yeah. Be. We thought it was going to be 900, didn't we? Did they just take, ah, uh, you kidding me? They don't even have the. Sale unders confirms it because he says he got the first wave. Okay. 999. That's insane. There's not that much worth of stuff in it yeah <laughs> although i guess there it's got it comes with a stand the uh the portal is 220 dollars okay, the dual sense edge is 220 dollars the other ones are not up on the site it's that extra 20 dollars yeah that that starts to add up I actually got insanely lucky and managed to get the anniversary bundle. I had no intention to flip it, but I mean, seeing these eBay listings, it's tempting. Yeah. You have to just watch a couple of these eBay listings and see if any of them actually sell for that much. Yeah. (laughs) uh, I don't know if they will. Was that it? Was that all? That's it. I haven't even looked for a tweet of the week. Oh, boy. I mean, there was definitely a tweet. Oh, absolutely.
Or we just dial in the stuff, find one. Yeah. Uh, oh, I got one. Copy it. Here, do the do the song. I'm I'll put trying, it in the key. I forgot the button. Quit of the week! Quit of the week! Quit of the week! There we go. This is from Electron Ash. It is the Titanic with the guy and the girl. Yes. He's opening a book, and it is a booklet of PlayStation 2 games. <laughs> yes. It's the scene from Titanic where Jack is showing Rose all the naked ladies he draws, and instead of oh, naked ladies, <laughs> instead of naked ladies, it is um, a jewel game. case booklet. Of, yeah. Of what, what games are these? It's uh, Medal of Honor, European Assault, uh, Resident Evil 4, Resident Evil 4, Guitar Hero 3, and uh, Driver, Driver Parallel Lines. Uh, this isn't a funny one, but uh, here's from Ryan Silberman. It says, living in a town with internet cutoff for days in a row has caused people to mass purchase physical media. Look at how empty the movie section of Walmart is. I have straight up never seen it like this. Wow. People even also went to GameStop to ask if they had movies or Xbox 360. Wow. This is just a physical media yeah. section empty because uh, there was like an internet shortage in, in, in some parts of yeah. the country. Well, I mean, some parts of the country are currently underwater, so... I think it was before that. Oh, I think wow. it was before the yeah. hurricane. Uh, some parts of the country, just the internet just... Yeah, out. yeah. Anyway, uh, now we're going to talk to you guys. Yes, let's start with people who have comments on last week's Wolf Den Podcast over on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Wolf Den Podcast. Oh, yeah, baby. We got uh geo geo fourth says i could be wrong but i'm pretty sure the dead space community highly disliked the remake main drama being the new team behind the remake decided to give one of the video game's most iconic silent protagonists isaac clark a voice and completely change his character visually so i do i do remember i've only ever played dead space one i do remember uh isaac clark being a silent protagonist and he didn't really have like he had like a facial like design but like you, you can only see it like in the opening cutscene if you turn the camera at the right moment the rest of the game he's in the mask and he doesn't speak at all dead space 2 not only is he not wear the mask for a lot of the game but he does like have dialogue in it mm -hmm. so almost immediately they changed isaac's whole thing for me in a silent protagonist that the player was supposed to project their own yeah. uh, feelings onto and just became an actual character so I feel like doing that for the remake kind of, in a way, puts it in line with the other games, you know? My interpretation was before... So you had Dead Space and you had Callisto Protocol coming yeah. out at the same time. Dead yeah. Space was EA. Callisto Protocol was the original developers yes. who were making their spiritual success. Yeah. So everybody hated the idea of a Dead Space remake right? because they wanted to support Callisto Protocol because that was the original developers and that was probably going to be the better game yeah so before either of these games released everybody wanted to hate dead space right and wanted to like callisto Protocol. Mm -hmm. then the games came out and everybody said callisto protocol sucks <laughs> yeah and dead space was actually pretty good right that was my interpretation of the news that was yeah that so i would imagine that people probably didn't like the dead space remake at first when they saw it because he was talking and stuff yeah but then when the games came out, ah, this game's pretty good. You know, yeah. that's what I would that, imagine. That was also like my understanding of the situation too. John says, not launching with OLED is literally criminal behavior. He means the Switch. Yeah. I hate that. I won't be buying OLED. I won't buy until OLED. I have an Odin 2 and Steam Deck. Uh, uh, that's fair. That's fair. And I do like OLED. Yeah. I think that things that are OLED are very nice. I want everybody to be careful of buzzwords. Yeah. Because just because something's OLED doesn't mean it's good or bad. Right. It needs to be a good OLED. Yeah. It could be a shit OLED. I have the OLED PlayStation Vita, which was the first model they came out with. And then the second model, the one you have, has a regular LCD screen. Yeah. They literally revised it to get rid of the OLED yeah. screen. Yeah. But I think the revised version is the one that sold better. Because they were able to make it cheaper in the battery less. Yeah. That's why. So there, you have to understand, like, certain concessions have to be made in order to get the product out at a reasonable time with a reasonable battery life and a reasonable price. Was it cheaper? Or was it just the battery? I think it was cheaper. I know the battery for sure. Yeah. Was it thinner? Yeah. Okay. 
it might not have been cheaper. It might have just been battery and dinner. Okay. While you look that up, uh, the bucket said, hey, guys, I was scrolling the eShop today and some interesting titles. Uh, the craziest thing I saw was new Totally Spies game that looks <laughs> a bit like Metal Gear. Excuse me? <laughs> Don't, if anyone watched the show back in the day, but I was thinking about old shows that could definitely use new video game. What do you... What do you all think, and what should? What do you think needs a new game? Will knows everything about Totally Spies. Oh yeah, of course. I confuse Totally Spies with the Winx Club, and I know those are two very different things. I don't know what the Winx Club, Club is. Apparently, the most successful Italian animated series of all time. Oh yeah, these are all the, these are like the two weird like four kids. TV sh like the four kids TV era of like Fox kids where like you had Ninja Turtles and you had Digimon and then like all the other crap I didn't really care about. It's literally Metal Gear. Look, there's a box part. There's a part <laughs> where they hide in a box. There it is. Oh, wow. I don't know, man. This could be it. I need a new stealth game. Does it? Uh, do they really go into nano machines at all? Throughout the course <laughs> of the uh, oh, wait, I lost everything. Stewie Hunter says, This is my first time listening to the podcast. Loving the flow you guys have. Consider the subscription button smashed. Oh my god, thank oh, you thank so much. You. Stewie Hunter. I appreciate it. The, How did you find us? The revised model of the PlayStation Vita was released uh in October of 2013 in Japan, uh, and North America in May of 2014. The revised model um is 20% thinner and 50% lighter compared to, compared to the original. Uh, while it largely re uh, maintains the original's overall structure and layout, the original's OLED screen has been replaced with a lower-cost LCD model. Uh, the model uh, roughly added about an extra hour of battery life. also comes with one gig of internal storage. Uh, upon inserting a PS uh, Vita memory card, the system will offer to copy existing data to the memory card. Uh, also has a micro USB port, uh, which can be used to charge the device alongside a standard micro USB cable. So it has uh, a bunch of upgrades. Yes, it doesn't say anything. I'm not seeing anything about price. Yeah, it might not have been cheaper, but it might have just had a lot of other quality right. of life stuff. And that's why it's sold right. better, probably. Introductory price two forty nine. That's the original version. Prof Rock says regarding the Switch's second USB C port. I believe it could serve as a connection for future accessories. Imagine a camera peripheral for fun, quirky activities, or even playing Pokemon Go on the device. Yeah. No, I mean, there's plenty of accessories that plug into the USB-C yeah. port now. Nothing fun like a camera. But, uh, yeah, you'd have way more peripherals with a whole other port. Uh, the, it did get a $50 price cut. The oh, okay. Model. Yeah. Okay, so it was cheaper. Yeah. Confirmed. Mm-hmm. Newer, better, cheaper, not, stronger, not no LED. Stronger, thing. faster, makes us better. I know a lot of people prefer the OLED version, yeah. you know, because it visually looks better. Yeah, yeah. But they were able to make it cheaper, and they were able to make the battery life mm -hmm. better. All right, now we're in the chat. All right, make it good. Make it good. Just talking about 2011 Thundercats. I would love the Tales of <laughs> Arise demos to make a game based on that timeline. What? The 2011, there was a 2011 Thundercats uh, reboot. Oh, the to Tales of Arise devs. Yeah. Okay. That show only lasted like a season because like nobody watched it because nobody really cares about Thundercats anymore. Unless they decide to make a weird chibi version of Thundercats. It's like more cartoony and, you know, comedy focused. Everyone, Pop vinyls yeah. version. Yeah. Uh, Cal Arts is what they call it. Oh, the Cal oh, Arts style Thundercats. like Teen Titans. Yeah. Go. Everyone's like, oh, why did they make this? Why can't they make a serious Thundercats show? First of all, it's Thundercats. It'll never fucking be serious. <laughs> Second of all, they did in 2011. You didn't watch it. It was okay. <laughs> Mecha Dragon with 26 months. Sorry, I keep being late to the shows, bros. Does it start at 8 p.m.? It usually does. Eight ish. <laughs> ish. Uh, Edward Bova, Bob, what's your opinion on rumor? Former Power Dev claims designs were changed to look more like Pokemon and does. Wait. Oh, this will be so funny. <laughs> Why would you put this out now? Yeah. 
uh, we're in for literally years worth of legal battles as just last month, the Nintendo and Pokemon company filed a patent infringement lawsuit in the Tokyo District Court against Pocket Pair, the Pokemon, the, the, the Power World developer. See, even I get the two confused. Ever since Power World was first revealed, people had been comparing the game to Pokemon. Nintendo and Pokemon Company said they would look into the game to see if there were any actual instances of copyright infringement or other unlawful doings, and clearly both companies now feel that's the case. This lawsuit seeks an injunction? Okay, just tell me. A former developer from Pocket Pair is now saying the, that PAL designs in PAL World were intentionally changed to look even more similar to Pokemon prior to the game's launch. Supposedly, the studio wanted PALs to mimic the look of the top 100 Pokemon, which was enough to make this one employee quit. After the employee left, he said the PAL designs were indeed changed to more closely resemble Pokemon. It's important to note that this is just one accusation uh, from a former employee so please don't take it as fact. That said, if this does turn out to be true and other employees cooperate, Pocket Pair could be in for an even tougher road ahead. Is anybody surprised? <laughs> also, there was at least one case where they had like a 16 or 17 year old working on the game. Yeah. Like a really young person as a designer for the yeah, game. Yeah, yeah. Um, as if that was like, that was reported on as like a look, it doesn't matter. They'll hire like if you're good, they'll they're hot, they'll hire you. It yeah. doesn't matter how old you are. Uh, that to me, you read like they're probably not paying them that much. They're probably a, a, a you know taking advantage of this kid, right? Uh, so it's all adding up. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if there were a couple of kids who were mm -hmm. paid lo low amount of money make this look lo as close to Pokemon as yeah. possible without it being Pokemon. I heard so many YouTubers be like, oh, shoot, I didn't know you were a minor when talking about their staff. Huh? Talking to the pocket pair staff? What are you talking about? Heartwarming. A major game developer loved this teen's work so much they decided to do a, ch a child labor. <laughs> Online checks are killing games. They're constantly checking if you own the game you're about to play, especially these subscription games. It does suck to have to constantly connect to the internet to play your games. Yeah. Uh, it sucks to download a bunch of stuff to your Steam Deck and then only to realize... You're on a plane and you can't... Yeah, I have, yeah. you have to like authenticate it the first time you play it. Yeah. I mean, like that's the one thing the Switch has over you know, other consoles is that like it... Um, developers like understand it's portable and like they kind of design it that way yeah especially nintendo so like you can play the games offline it's not a problem you know mm. like how the animation caddy has on his channel apparently the kid was 16 when he made it apparently his dad was the middle and oh gee uh benny was extremely young when he started acting. <laughs> <laughs> i never had a conversation yeah. about his age until one day he told me, and I was like, I'm too deep now. Yeah. But he's been paid well. Right. Just ask him. Steam will let you sue Valve now. Oh, oh yeah, yes. that's a thing. Uh, they removed uh, the force arbitration clause in their uh, EULA. So now you, you can just sue them like you can a normal person. <laughs> Yeah, that's some. That's the forced arbitration thing is uh, something that like everybody has in there. Yeah, uh, and they just decided that was a little weird. Yeah, Valve's also. We should have talked about this too. Valve announced that they're working with Arc Linux, like one of the biggest Linux distros. Yeah. Uh, so basically, Valve is the they're the Linux guys. Yeah. You have Microsoft is is the Windows guys. Yeah. You got Apple. They're the they're the Mac guys. Yeah. And then you have uh, fucking Valve is the Linux guys. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool of them to do that. Uh, thoughts on Echoes of Wisdom. Uh, Zelda, the new Zelda game is You good. played it. Yeah. I like it. Oh, cool. It's pretty good. Anna started playing it. Too. I haven't played that much of it, but uh, right. I'm playing it on my Ein Odin 2 Mini. 
It doesn't run that good. Okay. It runs great on the Steam Deck. It does not run. Also, there's like a rift in the game. Okay. Like, like there's like this big purple rift that yeah, takes yeah. up some of the map, and that does not run good on any emulator. Got it. But uh, it runs fine. It's good enough, and uh, I like playing the game. It's fun. Right. It's basically uh, Link's Awakening, but woke. But woke because you're a woman. Yeah. No, you can summon monsters and stuff. Okay. And, and like other things in the world and they're what fight for you so it's pretty cool you can like you have to figure out like what's going to work in what situation and what, right. what to cast and stuff it's cool i like it it's like a it's like a puzzle action game cool arc is one of the hardest linux distros to use also the one the users will brag about the most oh well, yeah because it's hard would you say that steam os is one of or what's the name of the distro that steam os uses would you say that that's one of the easier to use ones? Uh, Link's Awakening. That's a good name. They should have called it that. Steam OS is built on Arc. There are still games that on Switch that require internet to play that don't seem uh, to need internet, i.e. not online games. I think Ori uh, was uh, one that's like that. Had to use my hotspot to play it on a train. Yeah, I know there are some like games, especially some third-party games that do require internet connection, but by and large, the, the the games on Switch can be played easily and more fun offline than they can on yeah other systems. If it's your main system, then yeah, yeah. Uh, on Steam, every game needs to connect to the internet at least once. Yeah, I mean that's not to say there are you know exceptions like the Switch Online games. Um, yeah. those you have to connect to the internet like once a week in order to play them. Yeah. Uh, Steam OS is basically um, Ubuntu. Steam or Valve is working with Arc, I think, because they want to push updates to Arc so that it'll work better with Steam OS. Right. Like, like they'll get ahead of the stack. They don't have to wait for things to yeah. update for them to be able to to fix stuff. They can basically just control everything. Basically. Yeah. Um, I think it's fine. I think that'll be pretty cool for Linux in general. All right, uh, that's it. Thanks for hanging out, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for watching us. Thank you for uh, chatting with us. As always, the Wolf Den podcast is every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on twitch.tv slash Wolf Den or youtube.com slash Wolf Den podcast. If you can't make the show for any reason at all, we always put the archive version up on youtube.com slash Wolf Den podcast. So you can go and check us out over there on demand whenever you want. But if you prefer to listen to us rather than watch us, like Bob is doing right now, you can't see on, uh, off screen, but he's listening to something. Uh, you can do that as well because we're also an audio podcast on any and every podcast service. Be Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Cast, YouTube Podcasts, Audible.com even, but no matter where you get the show from, folks, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us because that helps us with placement on all of those respective platforms. I was going to raid Wood, but I think he's ending. That's why I was uh, uh, why I was listening. Should I do it anyway? <laughs> oh, yeah? <laughs> like... You know what? He's yapping. Yeah, just yapping. He's doing a lot of yapping. He's getting a raid. Go over there and say hello to Wood. Uh, Saying to Will a second time. Uh, I will hopefully have a video up on Thursday. I'm reviewing the iNeo Pocket Micro. It's pretty cool. It's got an OLED screen. Oh, boy. So you know it's great. Um, I don't know if it'll be up Thursday or Friday. Uh, And I don't know if I'm going to be streaming on Thursday. But, uh... Goodbye. <laughs> Bye.